of police, fire, or medical emergency. Uh, there was an accident. Okay, where is the accident at? Uh, Alice Bell. Alice Bell, can you tell me where on Alice Bell? By the highway. So Alice Bell and Far Hill, right there by 675? Yeah. How many cars were involved there? Not sure, but there are people stuck in cars here. There are injuries, yes? Yes, I think so. Can you tell me how many injuries? How many stuck in cars? I, I don't know. It's bad. Were you involved in this crash? Are you one of the drivers? Uh, yes, I'm a driver. Okay, hold tight. We're sending ambulance and fire. They're on their way. Okay. Thank you. going to see and hear what happens after a collision. This crash involves two vehicles. This type of crash can occur anywhere, in the city, on a country road, or a busy interstate highway. What you are going to see before you is the result of a crash, not an accident. It is the result of someone making a conscious decision to drive under the influence of alcohol and to speed. This decision puts their own lives and the lives of others in dire jeopardy. The actual chain of events that caused this collision began hundreds of feet away. The dynamics of a crash have many variables. The most significant variables of the impact of the vehicles are alcohol and the speed of car. Sydney, the driver of the left car, was wearing her seatbelt and the airbag was deployed. Her injuries are minimal. Sydney appears to be confused and is having some difficulty getting out of the car. The dispatcher received the call and dispatches the necessary rescuers, police, and equipment. Typically, police arrive first. They are on duty 24-7. Many fire and EMS personnel are volunteers responding to calls from their homes. Depending on the location of the crash, the first unit may not arrive for 10 to 15 minutes or maybe even longer. That is a very long time for victims to wait for help. Georgia, the passenger of the left car, was not wearing her seatbelt. The previous owner of the vehicle disconnected the airbags and did not deploy. At impact, Georgia's body was thrown forward. Her face smashed into the windshield, causing many cuts and bruises. Several ribs were broken as she impacted the dashboard. One of the jagged edges of the broken ribs has punctured the left lung, causing it to collapse. She has remained awake through all of this, and with each gasp for breath, she is aware of the excruciating pain as the broken rib bones break together. 
Georgia's spleen has ruptured in the aorta. The main artery for the heart has been torn open from the force of the impact. She is bleeding a massive amount of blood into her chest and abdomen. She is going to rapidly lose consciousness and will die before the arrival of the emergency medical services. In a fatal car crash, passengers are more likely to be killed than the drivers. For every eight driver fatalities, there are 18 passenger fatalities. Riley, the driver of the right car, was not drinking that night, but she was also not wearing her seatbelt. She was thrown into the dashboard on impact. She has a deep cut on her head and has suffered a severe brain concussion. Riley has chest injuries that are making breathing difficult and painful. Her spleen has ruptured and she is losing a large amount of blood into her abdomen. As Riley's knees impacted the dashboard, bones on both legs were broken. These are life-threatening injuries and she must get to the trauma center as quickly as possible. She's trapped in a car and care flight has been dispatched to the scene by the responding emergency personnel. Riley will be flown to Miami Valley Hospital, a level one trauma center. Jessie, the passenger of the right car, was not wearing her seatbelt. The airbag was deployed, but because she was not wearing her belt, she sustained some serious injuries. Jessie was thrown forward and entered the airbag, causing a broken leg. She also has a broken arm and several cuts and abrasions. She has a mild brain concussion as well. While these injuries are not life-threatening, she will have to undergo surgery to repair the broken bones. She is looking at a lengthy hospital stay and a recovery period with rehab. Jessie will be taken to the local hospital by ambulance. Sahal and Jared were both in the back seat of the right car. They were wearing their seatbelts. They have minor cuts and will be treated at the scene. Their parents will be notified, but this will happen after the more serious injuries are treated. Valerie and Shelby were in the back seat of the left car. Valerie had been drinking and was not wearing her seatbelt. Shelby had not been drinking, but due to the impact of the collision, suffered some severe injuries. Both will be taken by ambulance to Miami Valley. Sydney, the drunk driver, was given a sobriety test. The police confirmed that her alcohol level surpassed the legal limit. The police will arrest her and take her to station for further questions.
So Hall and Jared were both in the back seat of the right car. They were wearing their seat belts. This is Monica Mitchell reporting to you live from Channel 3 from Miami Valley Hospital. We have just gotten word of a tragic Centerville High School prom night accident on Alex Bell Road in Far Hills Drive. Joining us now is Dr. Green with a report on the accident. Dr. Green, what do we know so far? At this point, we have just received news from the police department that a sobriety test was given and failed, resulting in an arrest of a drunk teenage driver. Two cars were involved in the crash. We have several patients in critical care and one reported fatality at this point. No names are being released as parents and guardians are currently being contacted. Is alcohol suspected to be the contributing factor in this crash? Unfortunately, yes. The CDC reports teen drivers are 17 times more likely to be involved in a fatal car crash than any other age group. We have also discovered that multiple individuals involved in this accident were not wearing seatbelts. This dangerous combination gives Ohio one of the highest nationwide statistics, where roughly 13% of teens 16 and older have reported being in a car where drinking and driving has happened. In light of this tragedy, what is your advice for teens? The sad truth is that teens who drink before the age of 15 are seven times more likely to be in an alcohol-related crash, and only 44% of teens total say that they would definitely speak up if someone were driving in a way that scared them. Teens need to make good choices, speak up, and change this statistic. And for the parents? Parents need to ask questions. The Center of Behavioral Health Statistics and Quality reports that one in seven teens binge drink, yet only one in a hundred parents believe his or her teen does so. The evidence is here. It needs to be addressed and discussed. No parent wants to get the knock on the door that these parents are getting tonight. Thank you, Dr. Green. We'll be reporting to you as more information is known and as the Centerville community deals with this tragic loss. I went to a party, Mom. I remember what you said. You told me not to drink, Mom, so I drank soda instead. I really felt proud inside, Mom, the way you said I would. I didn't drink and drive, Mom, even though the others said I should. I know I did the right thing, Mom. I know you were always right. Now the party is finally ending, Mom, as everyone is driving out of sight. As I got into my car, Mom, I knew I'd get home in one piece. Because of the way you raised me, so responsible and sweet. I started to drive away, Mom, but as I pulled out onto the road, the other car didn't see me, Mom, and hit me like a load. As I lay there on the pavement, Mom, I hear the policeman say, The driver is drunk, Mom, and now I'm the one who will pay. I'm lying here dying, Mom. I wish you'd get here soon. How could this happen to me, Mom? My life just burst like a balloon. There's blood all around me, Mom, and most of it is mine. I hear the medics saying, Mom, I'll die in a short time. I just wanted to tell you, Mom, I swear I didn't drink. It was the others, Mom. The others didn't think. She was at the same house as I. The only difference is she drank and I will die. Why do people drink, Mom? It can ruin your whole life. I'm feeling sharp pains now. Pains just like a knife. The driver is walking away, Mom, and I don't think that's fair. I'm lying here dying, and all she can do is stare. Tell my brother not to cry, Mom. Tell Daddy to be brave. And when I go to heaven, Mom, put Daddy's girl on my grave. Someone should have told her, Mom, to not drink and drive. If only they had told her, Mom, I would still be alive. My breath is getting shorter, Mom. I'm becoming very scared. Please don't cry for me, Mom. When I needed you, you were always there. I have one last question, Mom, before I say goodbye. I didn't drink and drive, so why am I the one to die?
At the end of this prom night, a life has been lost. There have been countless surgeries, bruises, cuts, and innumerable lives forever changed. This is a tragedy that could have been prevented. Every decision had a consequence, and now, to share her own story with the L community, we introduce our guest speaker to you. Hi everyone, my name is Mandy Bai. I'm a flight nurse and outreach manager with CareFly Air Nolan Services. I just want to thank you for being here today. What we have to share is very important. Everybody involved in healthcare, first responders, our goal in life is to take care of people. The last thing that we want to see is you involved in a car crash. So I'm going to introduce a dear, very dear friend of mine. Her name is Laura. She has a very powerful message, and I want you to really take time to listen to what she has to share with you. First, I want to tell you guys thank you for having us here today. My name is Laura, I'm a proud mom of two wonderful boys. Joey, who would have been 26 this year, and Brian, who's 23. September 20th of 2010 was a Monday night. Joey was a senior at Pickle High School. His brother Brian was a junior. Joey and Brian were the best of friends. Wherever you saw one, you saw the other. We were sitting in the living room watching Swamp People, which was Joey's favorite show. I'm sitting on the couch. Joey's sitting on the floor with his head right here on my leg. The root for the swamper is coming for the gators because someone has to root for the underdog. Joey's like, Mom, I want to go to the farm science review tomorrow. It's my senior year. Can I please go? I'm like, yeah, you can go. So I signed his permission slip for him to go. Of course, if I signed his, I'm signing Brian's. I'm a nurse, and at that time I worked a job where I had to get up very early in the morning. I knew the boy that was driving the next day, so I didn't have any concerns. I told Joey that I loved him. And he told me all about farm science to me the next day after school. He says, I love you too, Mom. And I went to bed. Tuesday, September 21st, 2010, I'm at work. And at 1.45 in the afternoon, I get a phone call from my sister. My sister never calls me at work. I'm like, what's wrong? She's like, nothing. Just meet me at the license bureau in Troy. I'm like, okay, but what's wrong? She's like, nothing, just meet me. So all the way from Van Bay to Troy, I'm thinking that I'm going to meet my sister and it's going to be about our dad. But my dad's been hurt. Our dad's been, you know, he lives on the farm by himself. He's a little older. I think it's going to be about our dad. I met at the license bureau by Tuesday Air Patrol, Sergeant Weber and Trooper Baby. And I remember on the way in, either one of them will look at me. And I remember telling one of them, why does my heart pull my feet to run? And oh my gosh, you guys, I wish I had. The morning of the farm started to view, another one of Joey and Brian's friends decided that they wanted to go. So Joey stayed home and let his little brother go. My boys loved demolition derby cars, demolition derby garden captors. My husband was off work that day, so him and Joey decided to go to our friend's house in Dayton to pick up a ride in the lawnmower that Joey would have turned into some demolition derby monster. Trooper Baby sits me down in the chair at the license bureau, tells him there's been a horrible crash. Tells me that my husband's been taken by care flight and we don't know that he'll survive. And she tells me that my six foot two, 320 pounds little child is gone. And I remember telling her, this is the meanest joke you could ever play on me. And she's like, Lord, it's no joke. Joey's gone. Trooper Baby also happens to be my little sister. My guys were four miles from home. They were almost home. They were on State Route 718. When a lady decided to go to Myers and Troy, buy a six pack of compressed air, she huffed the can, she got high, and then she came to a suffocated driver. My son was driving, he had a seatbelt on. My husband was the passenger and had a seatbelt on. The lady went off the right hand side of the roadway. She came back up on the roadway, left the, went left to center and never stopped. Joey saw her and got down in the ditch to try and miss her. It didn't do any good. She had met 78 plus miles an hour head on. The impact took the cab of the truck, tore it off the frame, and my son's seatbelt actually came apart. And he went out the back window, he broke his neck and he died. When we talk to you guys about wearing your seatbelts, it's not because we want to nag, it's because that seatbelt will save your life. The coroner told me that if Joey's seatbelt had not come apart, he would be here today. But on the way out of the vehicle, he collided with me. 
with his dad. He broke his neck. He broke his ribs. He lacerated his face, and his spleen was lacerated. When you guys don't have your seatbelts on inside of the vehicle, if you ever had a crash, you're like a shirt and a dryer. A shirt and a dryer gets tossed around on it. Same thing, guys. That's what will happen to you. So please, please, wear your seatbelt no matter where you're at in the car. So now I have to call Brian. He's off making memories with him and Joey's friends. He asked me what's wrong. I told him to meet me at this to have a couple of pick up. He's like, Mom, what's wrong? I'm like, just meet me. So they get there and the boys walk it out of the truck and Ryan comes up. And I have to tell Brian about his dad. And then I have to tell him that his best friend in the whole wide world is gone. And I'll never forget Brian looking me in the face and asking me. I don't have a big brother anymore. I'm like, no, maybe you don't. The lady that um, killed Joey was arrested seven weeks later. She spent an hour in a holding cell and was released. They faced a felony one and felony two charge. Felony aggravated vehicular homicide and aggravated vehicular assault. But unfortunately, while she was out, two months later she died of a drug overdose. She leaves behind six children of her own, and she was only 29 years old. And her name was Nina. And do I hate her? No. I hope that she's in heaven. Hate darkens your heart, it darkens your soul, and it's a total waste of energy. The second hardest day of my whole life, you guys, was maybe very Joey. He was a senior. Joey was just like you guys in this room right now. He loved public school and hanging out with his friends. He loved complaining about the homework. He loved picking on his teachers. He was looking forward to graduation. He finally made it. He was a senior. I was looking forward to senior prom, graduation, and what joy we do after that. But because one person decided to drive in pair and speed, she took it all away. We had a close cast because of the injuries to Joey's face. But before we closed the lid, I got to see half of the right side of his nose, his right eye, his right ear, and his right cheek, and I got to kiss him with my right ear. And then we closed the lid, and that's the last memory I have of my child. Joey's friends are getting married, and I can't go to the weddings because every time I watch the mom and son dance together, it tears my heart out because it's something I don't get to do with Joey. His friends are having children. I'm getting money for a baby shower invitations and I can't go. Because it's another reminder of something that Joey didn't get to do. He didn't get to graduate from high school. He didn't get to get his first job, his first apartment. He didn't get to find the final love of his life. He didn't get to get married and start his own family. And he didn't get to become a machinist just like his dad. When you guys, we do this wrong prom because you guys are out in the masses. You're distracted because you're so excited for prom. But you guys, this is everyday life. You need to remember this every day, always. It was a Tuesday afternoon when Joey died. It was a clear blue day, and it never should have happened. But because one person made very bad choices about the the wheel, she took away my son. And I'm his mom, and I can't fix that. So I spent Christmas in the graveyard. I spent his birthday in the graveyard. I spent his death day in the graveyard. And any time that I want to see Joey, I go look at his stone because his face is on the stone. You guys, please, I am begging you. Buckle up. Put your cell phones away. There's nothing on that cell phone, guys, that's worth looking away from the road. And when you guys are out of prom or anywhere else and you've made a bad choice, don't you dare get behind the wheel here. You call somebody. Call your mom, call your dad, call your neighbor. Stay where you're at. Do not. Get behind the wheel. Leanne told me she was sorry all day long, but that would never put breath back in my child. Joey was one great kid. And it's been six years and six months. And I miss him. I miss him every day. I would do anything to hear him come to the door one more time and say, I love you, Mom. And I'd do anything for one more hug. But that's a wrong. I want you guys to grow up. I want you guys to make memories. I don't want you to become one.